we just lift up your name and praise today. Glorify your name, O God. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, we come together. And Lord, in this place, from our hearts, we join together in the unity of the Spirit to bring you all praise. Father, may every song sung, may every message preached, every scripture read, bring glory to your name today in Jesus' precious name. And we give the Lord the praise. And God's people said... Amen. Amen. You may be seated in Jesus' name. It's so great to be able to be with you this morning and just want to also welcome those on online church today. And it's going to be a great day of praise. Today is the fourth Sunday of Advent. Can you believe that? Only a few days left before that great, great day on Christmas Day. I'm so looking forward to being with family and friends as you are. And this coming Friday night, we are hosting our, uh, I was going to say Good Friday, (laughs) Christmas Eve in Sydney uh, service at 6.30. And uh, it's not too late. Get on the phone after service or email and invite a friend to be able to come to that service at 6.30 on Friday. It is going to be a great day. Day. Well, today is the fourth Sunday of Advent. We have lit the candles of joy, of peace, and of hope. Today, we light the candle of love. This is what Christmas is all about that God sent his only son. Why? Because he loves us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For the Father did not send his Son to condemn the world, but that through him we would be saved and have hope and joy and peace and life and salvation. Hallelujah. Can you praise him today? Hallelujah. Let's light the candle this morning. Okay, just before the, we continue in worship, um, Wayne Hilston, the, our missionary that we support in Israel, sent some Christmas greetings, and uh, I wanted to show that right at the top of the service this morning. So we're going to listen to Wayne for a minute, and then the worship team is going to continue to lead us. Shalom, our highway family, Wayne Hilston here. I'm standing just outside the little town of Bethlehem. You can see it in the distance. And right where I'm standing are the shepherd's fields. This is where David would raise his flocks. This is where Jesus was born, to be the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. In fact, these fields were very special. They were chosen, actually, for the, to be the place where lambs would be chosen to take to the temple every Passover to be slain. Well, Jesus is the greatest gift ever given to mankind. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And so as we exchange gifts this season, let's remember the great gift, Jesus Christ. So I thank you, Highway Church, for all that you've done for us. You continue to support us in such generous ways. And I just wanted to wish you a very, very Merry Christmas. i 
Let's sing in the Spirit this morning and give glory to Him. He is our hope. He is our peace. He's our joy. In Him we experience true love. God, we love you. And Lord, we love you with our praise. And in obedience, we give glory to you today. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you today as your people. Lord, we want to thank you that you have made yourself present here with us today. And Lord, right now you are working and speaking to hearts and to lives. And Father, you're bringing healing to people right now. You're bringing uh, joy to people right now. Father, you're releasing people from depression right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you, God. We thank you, Lord, that all those, God, who are even streaming in today, God, they are experiencing the presence of the Spirit wherever they are to bring salvation to bring deliverance and to bring healing today in Jesus' name. Lord, we lift up everyone, God. We think of our church family. We think of George today. Father, we pray that you would be with him. For Elizabeth, Lord, let her know your presence today in the name of Jesus. And God, we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. Amen. Praise God. Well, listen. For those who have come in through this service, again, let me just say welcome. It's great to be together with you. If you hadn't guessed by now, it's a little bit of a different service today. And I'm going to invite Sue and Chris to come and join me. And today is Ugly Sweater Sunday. We have been in a theme throughout Advent and uh, we have been uh, preaching along this theme, and today we are wanting to just have a little bit of fun and enjoy fellowship together, and we have some prizes to give today. So um, I'm going to ask our two judges to come. No, sorry. You will notice that we've added some lovely poinsettias to our tableau up front here. We'd like them to be here yet for at least Christmas Eve service, but if you would like to take one home with you for a $10 donation to the food bank, you may that evening. Just sign a list so I know the right people get the right ones, that's all. I have it here, okay? Um, don't take them home before Christmas Eve, please. We'd like them to be here for that. So, we've picked a couple of categories, and Pastor Chris, I'm gonna ask you if you would take a look around and see who you think as kind of like the most festive. Pastor Ralph and I don't count for the most bright one, let me tell you, because we're just a clash. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I, have, I have an opinion, but I'm, I'm thinking someone who actually wore a tree skirt to church tonight <laughs> should win for most festive. <laughs> there you go, Miss Kathy. <laughs> Yay! This one is, next one is a bit of a test of our memories, but who here is wearing their festive garment that is the oldest, that you've had it a long time? Now, I'm going to start with, and you have to beat it, but I'm not going to take a prize, I promise. I've had this sweater six years. So who's got on a festive garment that's older? They've had it longer than six years. Seven? What do we got here? There's a 10. Anybody long, have an, an, a sweater on that's older than 10 years to you? All right. 10 it is. <laughs> there we go. So this is where Ralph and I just don't count because ours are really bright. 
But Pastor Chris, you see someone wearing something incredibly bright. Might have to go up there and look a bit. There's, there's a bright white here. There's a... That bright red jacket upstairs there is pretty sweet. And she's, she's blushing almost as bright as her jacket. <laughs> Would you run that up to Amelia for wearing a very bright orange shirt? So, for those of you who were here with us last week, and while we're calling it the Ugly Sweater uh, series, I actually did kind of the antithesis and wore this red formal gown last week to surprise everybody. And I surprised myself because I made it fit. But there is someone here today who is unusually dapper in their, their attire because they've done something different than they normally do. And this is, I think, for Mr. Paul Masters for wearing a suit to church on Sunday. <laughs> And thus endeth the entertainment portion of this morning's service. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Chris. How many know you can still have fun in church? We can laugh, we can sing, we can just enjoy. That's what this is all about. So thank you for everyone for your participation this morning. Well, we are in, can you believe it, the fourth Sunday of Advent. It is unbelievable how quickly this season has been going so far. And this coming Friday, again, uh, to announce at 6.30, we will be gathering here for our great Christmas in Sydney, Christmas Eve service, and we'll have a great time of worship, of songs, of scripture. I've got a message to share, and uh, we just encourage you to not just come, but come and bring someone, because we want everyone as possible to be able to enjoy the glory that is Christmas. If you've got your Bibles, you can uh, put your finger in Colossians chapter 3 for a moment. But as we begin, we are in our fourth and concluding message of the Ugly Sweater series. The previous three weeks, we began with our thoughts. How everything begins in this two by four up here on our shoulders. And from our thoughts come words. And our words also quite often are, expre are expressed because of the motives that are in our hearts. Well, today I want us to go one further step from our head, from our heart, from our mouth to our hands and feet. What do we do as followers of Christ at Christmas time? Unfortunately, there are those at this Christmas time where they demonstrate not the beauty of Christmas, but the ugly sweater part of Christmas. And some of you know what I'm talking about. There are some at this season that brings great distress 
It's a stressful time of year. How are we going to pay for things? How are we going to get to be with our family? What about so-and-so? What if that relative is going to come to the Christmas family gathering? And it can be an extremely stressful time for many people. And as a result, their actions are can be less than what you might consider Christ-like or Christmas joy filled. But I believe that what God wants to do more than anything, he wants to take our ugly thoughts, our ugly motives, our ugly uh, words, and our ugly actions and turn them into beauty. He wants to take those ashes and turn them into beauty in his name. Can you, believe, can you believe with me today? He wants to turn ugly actions into beautiful actions, godly actions that are a demonstration of his love. Because that's part of what Christmas is all about, isn't it? It's God demonstrating his love to, to, to humanity by sending his son. So the question then, what does love mean and look like? Well, someone went and asked a group of four to eight-year-old children what love means. Can I share some of them with you this morning? Well, I'm going to anyway. <laughs> Rebecca, age eight, writes, when my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her to toenails anymore, so my grandfather does it for her all the time, even when his hands got arthritis too. That's love. Carl, age five, says, love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on shaving cologne and they go out and smell each other. <laughs> I am sure Carl's brother or sister really appreciated that. Love is when you go out to eat and give someone most of your french fries without, giving them, uh, without making them give you any of theirs, says Chrissy, age eight. And da Danny, age seven, says, love is when my mummy makes coffee for daddy and she takes a sip before giving it to him to make sure that taste is okay. Bobby, age seven, writes, love is what's in the room with you at Christmas if you stop opening presents and listen. That's pretty intuitive, isn't it? Noel, age seven, writes, love is when you tell a guy you like that, that you like his shirt, then he wears it all the time. <laughs> I love Cindy, age eight, what she says. During my piano recital, I was on a stage and I was scared. I looked at all the people watching me and saw my daddy waving and smiling. He was the only one doing that. I wasn't scared anymore. That's a good daddy. Chris, age seven. Love is when mommy sees daddy smelly and sweaty and still says he is handsomer than Brad Pitt. <laughs> the best one, though, is from Jessica, age eight. You really shouldn't say I love you unless you mean it, but if you mean it, you should say it a lot. People forget. A lot of truth there, isn't there? A lot of great definitions. Reminds me of what the Apostle John writes in 1 John 3.18. Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. And John is simply reflecting what he saw Jesus do while he was on earth. You see, love is very simple. Love is doing what Jesus did. That sounds pretty simple. Also very challenging when you consider all of the situations Jesus found himself did not uh, necessitate a return of love, yet that's what Jesus did. No matter who said what about him, he always went about doing good. He went about doing his father's business, which was doing good. And isn't this all what the Christian life is all about? 
As a follower of Jesus, we are commissioned to live in such a way that honors Christ, not just in our thoughts, not just with our motives, not just with our words, but in our actions as well. That everything we say and do reflects who Jesus is to us. And yet there are many people that simply don't seem to get it. Much like the husband that Sue talked about last week who bought his wife a brand new deep fryer for Christmas, believing that she would be so glad to cook him his favorite meals? No. Christmas, like love, is not about what we expect to get, but it's what we have been given through Christ and how we share that love with others. Paul writes about this selfless act in Philippians chapter 2. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Christmas is all about the grace of Filled, mercy motivated, selfless, selfless act that the Father had. And Jesus, in obedience, follows his Father and comes to earth as a babe. And, folk, it was an intentional act of love. And this is what I want us to see this morning. This is what I want us to understand when we think of the love of God for you and I. Not only was it uh, selfless, not only was it sacrificial, but it was intentional. It was planned out through the, before time began that the Father would send his Son to earth so that we might know his grace, mercy, and and love. And so when we think about actions, the first thing that I want us to consider are some of the crazy things that people do in the name of Christmas. And now I have to look up to Stephen. You've got this sermon in the palm of your hands. Do you have that video? Hello, my name is Lewis, and um, I love Christmas. <laughs> I love everything about it. Uh, the snow, the lights. <gasps> I'm sorry. Um, but most of all, I love the reason for the season. And that's why this year, as a Christian, I got so tired of hearing that disrespectful phrase. You know the one. Happy holidays. Every time somebody'd say it to me, I would give them a good old Merry Christmas right in their face. <laughs> Booyah for the Messiah! Stop getting riled up. You're gonna hurt yourself. Mom! I'm trying to talk here! Whatever. I'm calling Dr. Goldstein. <laughs> Sorry. I had to move back in with my mother after all this. Tell the truth, sweetie. Fine. Fine. I've always lived with my mother. Against my better judgment. Mom! Mom! Can I just tell my story? So recently, I went to the supermarket to pick up some eggnog. As I walked in, the guy standing next to the grocery carts throws a big, Happy Holidays, mister! Right in my face like it's no big deal. But guess what? What, honey? It was a rhetorical question, Mom. I am building the drama of the story. Always so dramatic. What? Oh, oh, I'm the dramatic one? Oh, really? Anyway, the kid, this Happy Holidays punk, just got me riled up. So I grab the nog and I go to pay. The clerk rings me up and what does she say? Happy Holidays. <laughs> <laughs> 
I was enraged. I was in a blind fury. I jump up on the counter, I grab the microphone, and I yell into it. It's not a holiday, people! It's Christmas! I'm mad as heck, and I'm not going to take it anymore! <gasps> Unfortunately, my foot slipped, triggering the conveyor belt. Now, bread and milk doesn't seem to be moving too fast, but a 175-pound man flies off that belt. And fly I did. Not like a majestic eagle or a superman. I flew like a partridge falling out of a pear tree. I flew into a display of Chia Pet nativity sets. Thus, my current condition. And then something funny happened. A gift arrived for me. Mom, a little help, please? No, not that one. No, 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 no. no uh, to, to your left. Your left! No. The one that arrived! <clears throat> That's the one. Thank, thank you. You watch your tongue with me, Lester. <laughs> huh? It was from Elizabeth. The girl whose checkout stand I'd commandeered. She'd given me a gift. <laughs> At first, it didn't make sense. I, I didn't deserve anything good from her. Not, not, not the way I acted. I, I acted like a maniac. But then I, I got to thinking. I had been bound up in religion. <laughs> and I didn't want to be <laughs> bound up anymore. Religion is, is always having to be right. Grace. That's, that's being right with others, being right with God. So, so this gift, I, I don't know what's in it. It could be more eggnog. It could be a, a Chia Pet nativity set. Doesn't matter. The real gift is better than either of those things. Oh, you two are destined for wedlock! Mom! Why did you do that? Why do you always go there? We're not going to get married! It's a match made I don't even fun. know her! But you said she it was... It doesn't matter if I said she was cute! People do some crazy things in the name of Christmas. Sometimes we get ourselves so uptight about the Christmas season, what we have to do, what others expect of us, that without thinking, we end up flat on our face or in a lazy boy in a cast. But the saddest thing that I find is when we are not careful, we can allow our stress and those things to cause us to actually not only get ourselves hurt, but to hurt others. I had something happen to me not too long ago where I was in a, a business in the community and I was, I'll, I'll be honest, I, I was not in a very good frame of mind when I came into the begin, in the business to begin with and I was not treated, I felt, like a customer needed to be treated. I had been in this business many times before, and I thought to myself, who does this person think they are? Don't they know who I am? Don't they realize that I am the reason they're still in business? I am a loyal customer. And I walked out of that store, and I, I tell you, I was righteously indignant. I went home and I wrote a letter to that, to that business owner and I just gave it to them. I went, I handed it to them, and when I left that business, man, did I ever feel convicted. Because that person did know who I was. I am glad to say to you very humbly that I did return and I talked with that business owner. Found out 
that he had once given his heart to the Lord. And through a series of situations, mainly caused by pastors who were probably not in a very good mood, he just kind of walked away. We both shared our stories, and thankfully, we apologized. We both sought forgiveness, and I'm believing God that a new friendship has been born. I wish that could be all the time, don't you? But oftentimes, especially at this time of year, if we're not careful, we can allow all the stress and all of uh, our anxiety to overwhelm us so that it comes out not just in ugly thoughts and ugly motives and ugly words, but ugly actions as well. And I am praying that as we look at God's word together, that by his spirit, that we will all learn what it means to put on those garments that are reflective of the love, the mercy, and the grace of Jesus Christ. But to do it, folk, we have to be intentional. And so therefore, we have to be careful to, uh, of what outfit we are going to choose. Because at the end of the day, it's your choice. It's my choice. God doesn't force us to be Christ-like. He commands us to. He calls us to. He gives us the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to. But at the end of the day, we have to make that choice to submit to him. And that's what some Christians in Colossae were having a challenge with. They were wanting to serve God. They were wanting to follow God. They were living in extremely stress-filled times. And the world was pressuring them to conform to what the world thought was important. And they were wanting to find how God would want to have them live to be a witness to their community. And so the Apostle Paul writes to the Colossians, and in chapter 3, he gives to them an outline of the garment that God wants us to wear. And I think as we go through these, these are wonderful garments and decorations to wear from our hearts as we go out and we share Jesus' love with others this season. In chapter 3, and in verse 12, we read, Therefore, as God's chosen people holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves, there's the choice, there's the intention. God doesn't just drop it from heaven, it's already there, it's kind of like the clothes that you used to put on the bed for your kids in the morning, and yet they would still ask, Mom, what am I going to wear today? It's on your bed, wear what's there. But Mom... The rest of your clothes are in the laundry. Where's my favorite shirt? It's in the laundry. We have to wear. God has laid it all out for us, folk. He's laid it all out for us. And when he says clothe, the word clothe in the Greek is the word enduo, which means to put on. Literally, it means to sink into a garment or to cover yourself. How many have do have a favorite Christmas sweater at home or a blanket at home that you just can't wait to put on because it fits you so comfortably you just sink into it or you take that blanket and you just cover yourself and it's like your whole body becomes enveloped by that blanket. How many have something like that at home? I know I do. Many of us do this morning. Well, that's what this word and duo means, to sink into a gar garment and to cover yourself. It's an active word that Paul uses here to paint a picture for his readers. In their order for us to demonstrate God, acts of godly love to people, we must intentionally put on new and better kinds of actions. And notice what he says. First of all, he says, put on compassion. This is the ability to see a situation from someone else's point of view. 
to see what someone else is feeling. Compassion is what leads people to serve others or to give sacrificially. Compassion is the key to changing a broken world. And this takes a selfless attitude but results in people actually listening. And so Paul says we need to close ourselves with compassion as well as kindness. Kindness sounds simple, but let's be honest. There's a whole lot of work that goes into this. Especially, it's one thing to be kind to people that love us and love us back, but to be kind to people that don't show that, demonstrate that kindness to us? That's the kind of godly, Christ-like kindness that Paul is describing here. It's that kindness that goes beyond what we think we deserve. It's that kindness that says, this person cannot repay me, but I'm still going to be kind. And this involves humility. Paul tells us, clothe ourselves in humility. And humility is not thinking less of ourselves, it's thinking of ourselves less, isn't it? Humility is taking on the kind of mentality Jesus taught and modeled for us. Selfishness is an ugly sweater attitude that results in ugly actions. But humility is the way in which we overcome our selfish attitudes and follow in the way of Jesus. And when we walk in humility, kindness, and compassion, we also put on gentleness. What is gentleness? It is simply controlled strength. Moses, one of the courageous heroes of the Bible, was called one of the most humble, gentle men who ever lived. Jesus was considered gentle, though he demonstrated great strength of character. Gentleness is not weakness. Gentleness is that humble strength that keeps you focused on what's important. It's that attitude. It's that thing that says, it's that calmness of spirit that settles people down around you. And going hand in hand with gentleness and kindness is patience, is patience. Some translations translate this long-suffering, and it means to simply put up with something or someone for a long time without giving up. But the most important piece of clothing is that of love. Read with me Colossians 3, verses 12 to 14 in its entirety. So as those who have been chosen by God, let me ask you, if, if you've been chosen by God, you are a disciple of Christ, you're a follower of Christ, you know him, guess what? He has chosen you. Not because you or I are special, not because you or I are better looking than anyone else, not because you and I have more talent than anyone else. No, he's just simply chosen you because he loves you. So those who, of you who have been chosen by God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And beyond all these things, put on what? Put on love, which is the perfect bond of of unity. Folk, that's how we're going to bring, see change happen here in Sydney. It's understanding that in everything that we do, love is not just a word or a feeling. It is an action. It's a verb. Love is doing what Jesus did. What does it look like? You may have heard of Father Damien, the missionary to the lepers. Father Damien was a Belgian Catholic priest who was sent to minister to the lepers on the Hawaiian island of Malachi. 
When he arrived, he immediately began to meet each one of the lepers in the colony in hopes of building a friendship. But wherever he turned, people shunned him. It seemed as though every door was closed, so he poured his life into his work, erecting a chapel, beginning worship services, and pouring out his heart to the lepers. But it was to no avail. No one responded to his ministry, not one. And so, after 12 years, Father Damien made the difficult decision to leave Hawaii. Dejectedly, he made his way to the docks to board a ship to take him back to Belgium. As he stood on the dock, he wrung his hands nervously as he recounted his futile ministry among the lepers. As he did, he looked down at his hands and he noticed some mysterious white spots and felt some numbness. Almost immediately, he knew what was happening to his body. He had contracted leprosy. It was then that he knew what he had to do. He returned to the leper colony to do his work. Quickly, the word about his disease spread through the colony. Within a matter of hours, everyone knew. Hundreds of them gathered outside his hut. They understood his pain, his fear, and uncertainty of the future. But what was the biggest surprise was the following Sunday, as Father Damien arrived at the chapel, he found it full to the rafters with hundreds of worshipers. And there in humility, he stood before them and said, I am now one of you. He realized then the power of the love and grace and mercy of God. How God intentionally sent his son Jesus to become like a man, to die on a cross because of love. He remained there until his death, continually living out the love of God to those people that he had been called. What does love in action look like for you and me? John goes on to say in his letter, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. For God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. And this is how love is made complete in us. So that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. So how do we do this? How do we do this as we prepare to be with family at Christmas? Some family members that we avoid the rest of the year. How do we do this? I'd like to leave you with five ways that we can intentionally demonstrate and show the love of God to others this Christmas season. Number one, we can show God's love by simply listening to people. Simply listening to them. In today's culture, it seems like so many voices are speaking and even shouting. Communication is always at our fingertips through email and texting and social media. And while social media has increased uh, communication, it has also given us a false appearance of true connection and real relationship. And in this day in which we're living, it's rare to feel that we're truly heard. I challenge us to find those moments when we can sit down with someone amongst the din of the noise around us and simply listen to their story. I tell you, I am so glad that I sat down and I listened to a story of that business owner. I'm so glad. Didn't have any answers for him. But he knew I listened. Let's find that time and place to listen. Secondly, let's show God's love with generosity. Now, it's not a surprise that Christmas time is, is when charities receive their greatest amount of generosity by people around the world. But I'm not just talking generosity through our finances, though that is part of it. But let's seek to be generous with our time, with our talents, as well as with our treasure. 
And as we listen, as we love through generosity, let's encourage people. Let's be an encouragement to people. Let's show God's love by encouraging someone. I think at this time of year, after all that we have been through in the last two years, after all of the news that we're, we're getting from our provincial leaders and government spoke, don't you think that people need some encouragement? I think it's time that we find people that we can just say, you know what, you're doing great. Maybe it's going to a restaurant after church today and just saying to that waitress, thank you for a job well done, and then tipping them accordingly. Folk, let's find those opportunities to encourage. And as we encourage people, let us also find places where we can show God's love with acts of kindness. And folk, as we listen to people, as we encourage them, as we show compassion, it won't be too hard to figure out how God would have us show acts of kindness. And folk, never forget this. Show God's love by praying for others. Pray for them. They may not, you may not think that they expect it, but let's pray for them. Einer, can I pick on you this morning? Could you just join me? You had an experience this week with your neighbor. Would you take a few minutes and just share how that went this week? Yep, absolutely. There you go. It was a, a neighbor, a man that I know very well. I talked to him many times across the fence and so he disappeared early then. Well, sometimes this summer I didn't see him outside anymore. And then we just found out he had, he had cancer. Ended up in the hospital. And his wife came over to me a couple of days ago anyways and just told me he's in the hospital and all. And so I said, do you think, can I go and see him? Oh yes, he says, you know, you, you can go. So I, I went over to the hospital and not being vaccinated, they ask all these questions. Are you vaccinated? I said, no. Oh, no, you can't come. Then I was just about ready to walk away. And she said, no, hold it a bit. I'll phone and find out. Yeah, you can go. I thank God that, you know, there are people praying for me. And I had just talked to Pastor Ralph, and he said he will pray for you before you go, and others as well. So thank you to all of you who knew this. So I went into him, and he was quite weak. You know, he's been down sick for quite a while, and he was talking, but it was, it was difficult to understand out, and they said, you get 15 minutes, and then you have to go. That was the hospital, I said. So toward the end, I said to him, I said, can I pray with you? And he sort of nodded his head, and I went over to him, because I like to lay hands on people when I pray for them like that, but I didn't know exactly what you could do in this situation. So he reached out his hand to me, like this. And I, I put my hand in his hand and I prayed for him. And he squeezed my hand, which is a sure sign of, you know, thank you. And I left because that was, that was all I could do at that time. But I just, I want to thank God for being so good that we can go, that God can send us to situations like this. And that he will respond in that way. It's just, a, it blesses your heart when you know you can go and pray with people. It might, I don't know if he's still alive or not, but he, he could be. But I want to thank God for that opportunity I had to do exactly this. There was nothing I could do except for that. Just lay him down before God in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Weiner. Thank you for your obedience to the Lord. Folk, there are people you and I know, people that right now, you would think there's no way that they're open to God. There's no way they're open to anything spiritual. But you'll never know until you ask. You don't know what they're going through. You don't know the stresses they're under. And they may say no, but folk, they may also say yes. 
And folk, even if they say no, you can still go back to your home and still pray for them. But I think one of the most loving things we can do is praying for others, showing acts of kindness, encouraging them, listening to them through generosity and in compassion. Let us show the love of Jesus. See, that's what God did in Christ. That's how he did for us. In order to show love for others, we have to put it into action. To move from ugly actions to godly ones starts with love. And the word here that Paul uses, of course, is agape, which is a sacrificial, God-like, intentional love that costs everything. The question is, are you and I willing to pay the cost to live that kind of love? We cannot just say we love people, but we need, with the help of the Spirit, to show Christ's love through our godly actions. That's what God did for us, wasn't it? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to judge it, but that the world might be saved through him. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you we've been able to come this morning and we've been able to enjoy singing these songs. Lord, I, I even thank you, God, for the humbling experience of technology that sometimes doesn't work. Because I know in spite of what we do and plan, you still operate by your spirit and your will is still done. And Father, I thank you for the privilege of being able to share your word this morning. And Lord, the testimony we heard from Einar. And, and God, we just pray, Lord, for this gentleman again, Lord. I pray, Father, Lord, that God, the, the witness that has been given to him would bear fruit and that before he would breathe his last lord he would call out to you in jesus name and father right now what i'd like us to do right now if you've got someone in your circle maybe it's a family member someone uh, a friend a neighbor uh someone in your in your circle that needs this they need jesus today i want you just to lift your hands and by faith let's lift that person those persons to the lord this morning father in the name of jesus we just think of these people right now we think lord that today god you're calling them father i pray lord for opportunities to demonstrate compassion listening kindness patience lord that we would even pray with them father that god through this week lord we would uh, have opportunity to show and demonstrate your love in action in Jesus name God we just lift our sons our daughters our family members our friends and neighbors in Jesus name we give you the praise the honor and the glory and God's people said amen sing glory to the newborn king peace on earth and mercy mild god and sin is reconciled joyful all ye nations rise join the triumphs of the skies nature rise and worship him who is born at Bethlehem Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Christ by eyes, heaven adored Christ the 
everlasting Lord Late in time Be old him come Offspring of a virgin's Veiled in flesh The God at sea Hail the incarnate Deity Pleased as man with man to appear Jesus our Emmanuel here Heart the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Hail the herald Prince of Peace Hail the Son of Righteousness Thank you.